um, if I knew that, if I had known that uh, Benny, um, just as the uh, presentation out of his button, then I wouldn't have bothered making one. I'm not a fan of slides, but I actually, I did some, um, just for you guys. So, uh, so I'm going to start with uh, taking questions. And uh, by that I mean I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So, um, I already saw that there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurs who here runs a location-independent kind of business. And who has trouble being location-independent? Any problems with that? Okay, so my talk is a little bit about how I uh, approached the, uh, the business of my girlfriend, actually. And um, before I start, um, two little, I'm going to do a little sandwich. So before I come to the, the topic I'm going to talk about, I'm going to make two little um, tangents. One is, um, with all those talks, there's the outcome bias. And um, I'm talking a lot about this with my friend Chris Kirkland on our podcast. Um, and the outcome bias is a little bit like this. Um, Everybody is talking about what they did because, uh, that made them successful. The problem is that maybe it's rather what they didn't do that makes them, that makes them successful, made them successful. And uh, you gotta check out Nas and Talib, and you also gotta be aware, and it also counts for me, never taking advice from a salesman or any advice that benefits the advice giver. <laughs> So, um, what are we going to cover? Um, I'm going to tell you what I, what I did and why I did it, and uh, that's the overview. Most slides are basically for me, there's a couple of you for you, I'm going to point them out explicitly. So, the background. Um, <laughs> I, um, I read the four hour work week, I was living in a rather rural area of Germany, and so there was nobody to talk to, and I was really longing for to come to this group years ago and uh, meet people and talk about the four hour, week work, four hour work week and entrepreneurship. And what I experienced was that um, while I was kind of like processing the ideas of the four hour work week, nobody seemed to believe me. I mean, this was years ago, and I was talking about working less, outsourcing stuff, and everybody was like, you're nuts. Um, and um, my girlfriend already had a running business. And when I'm, when I'm saying a running business, I mean a business that doesn't have a couple of problems. She always had a really great product or service. She has been running a dance school, mainly teaching children um, what's in Germany called Kreativer Kindertanz. So, uh, and ballet, ballet horses. And um, I thought um, that should be easy to uh, help her work less and actually apply everything. So I'm the, I'm good in theory, she was good in practice, and I tried to basically make her business location independent. And here's some examples of what I did. So, that's probably the most valuable slide I made for you. And um, maybe this is already pretty clear to you, maybe it isn't. This is a really good framework to keep in mind for whatever you do. Um, maybe you know Taylor Pearson, also DC. Um, he recently wrote an article about the value of consultants and basically said would be the value would be to make implicit systems or processes explicit. And that's because then you can um, work with them. So what you do is you build a model. So you go you go somewhere and you ask people what they do, you observe them and you let them show you what they do, how they do it. And you have to ask a lot of questions to kind of like get all the parameters that they use to make their decisions and so on and so forth. And then, once you make the uh, system or process explicit, you can improve it and you can streamline it. 
A huge problem, in my experience, are exceptions. Exceptions are a pain in the... And um, so you got to manage to use them as much as you can. Then, obviously, I wanted to translate everything into the digital world. And uh, I'm later going to talk about the limits, so some of the problems I encountered, where I basically also gave up. And uh, why I think, and that's another main idea I want to um, introduce, why I think that even aiming at making the business location independent is going to provide a lot of robustness to any business. So uh, Chris and me, as I said, have talked about this as well. Um, have talked about this on the podcast, and the idea is this. If you can make your business, if you can run your business from wherever, then um, you don't have to be away, but you can be away. And having a choice is always better than not having a choice. So let's look at what I did. Um, this is in German, I didn't bother to translate it. It's a really old document I made. But here's an example of what I mean by making an implicit process explicit. So, my girlfriend was um, answering the phone and um, for her dance school, she was much like in a position as... Um, let me check this. Just so that caffeine so my laptop won't go off. So, um, she was answering email as well as um, the phone. And there were all kinds of things coming in. And to her, it was like, nobody else can do this. I have to do this. I know everything. I, can, I, can, I have to talk to those parents. I have, I'm the only one who can answer all these questions. So I basically stripped this down and I said, look, there's only four things that can happen when somebody, when basically information comes in. One is people have a question. There's got to be a limited amount of questions people can have. So what we do is, we build an FAQ, and we give this to somebody else, and they answer the email or the phone. Either they, can, they, they know what to do, so they can look it in, up in the FAQ, or they don't know. So I have here, if unknown, mail to Anke or Nico, ask, and then um, expand the FAQ, and so you have a self-generative, generative, self-generating system that basically um, works towards completion. It could also be just some kind of information that comes in, so it's got to be forwarded to somebody else. Um, it could lead to an action, it could mean you have to check, maybe um, somebody has changed their email address or their phone, their phone number, so you've got to check the customer record, or uh, you can book somebody into a course right now, so you've got to put them on a list for people to wait. Um, really early document, so again, switch. Yes. So um, this is about paying employees, just another example. Um, and this is a more sophisticated uh, flowchart, I got better with time, looks even looks nicer. So what happens, we have different people working for the company, um, they gotta, you know, send in how much, how much time they work, this gotta go into some kind of calculation, and then I went through all of that, I said then this is going to go to our tax accountant, they're going to send something back, and then somebody going to, has to um, pay the employees. So, um, these were some of the things that worked. We did that, we did that pretty well. Um, another thing that I did, which is not even worth a flowchart, is, for example, we had a lot of, a lot of snail mail so, uh, coming in, so I purchased a scanner, a little uh, doxy scanner, I think it's called, it has a Wi-Fi card, and we have uh, my girlfriend's mom scanning all the mail, and it's automatically uploaded to an Evernote Premium account, and this is where we sort it, everybody has access to it. One of the basic principles is all the information needs to be accessible to everybody on the team and to yourself from anywhere, so you've got to put stuff online, and these were some examples. So, uh, what didn't work? For example, 
um, I, was, I started building an online booking system. So, because I thought every, everything's got to be really, 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 really automated. And um, so I thought we can't answer the phone and we shouldn't do that kind of stuff. We just have to, people have to buy the service on the website. And that's a problem. Um, because, and that's why I said I'm going to talk about some of the limitations I ran into. Because, for example, it was really, you wouldn't believe this, I mean, you guys wouldn't believe this, but this was really, really a lot of fighting and discussion to even get everybody to provide us with an email address. Like, we had people talking about a rural area, you have parents of children, and we said, like, everybody has to have an email address. Because later, obviously, I had to build a system where we can, you know, inform everybody, let's say, that he just gets sick or the time changes or this or all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't easy. It was not that I said, well, we need, help from, we need an email address from every customer and then they had it. And that's different if you are already starting in the digital space. Like if you are obviously, if all your customers find you through your website, then that's something. Uh, I give you an example. I recently, um, so I, you, you have to understand this. I'm the system guy. I'm the theoretician. I'm setting up all these systems. I'm thinking in flowcharts. I want to make everything automated and stuff. So uh, I call up my lawyer because I got to sue somebody or whatever because they don't pay me. So I call up my lawyer, and my lawyer is actually a friend of mine. Like uh, he used to live with him, and. Um, so I call up my lawyer, I say, um, dude, it's been more than two weeks and I have sent you two, you guys two emails, I have not heard back from you. I'm a new client, why does nobody care? Why does nobody care? And he said, well, I see your case file on my desk and I also see there's some emails on top of it. And I'm like, did you just say print out my emails? And he's like, sure. And I'm curious, I mean, I mean I'm really curious, and I'm saying like, so why did I not get any response to my emails? He says, well, because the people that get the email, our office help managers, whatever they're called, they um, are not allowed to answer emails. So they print them out, he was sick, I wasn't notified, and then uh, they put him on his desk. I said, so, okay, so what happens if you reply? This is the greatest example of how people run their businesses. I said, so what happens, so if you reply to my email, how does that work? And he's like, um, well, obviously I'm gonna dictate my reply to my assistant. Then she's gonna type it, print it out, put it in my inbox, I mean like a physical inbox on his desk, where then he picks it up again, he reads through what he dictated her, proofreading so that nothing gets out that he hasn't seen and controlled, and then he signs it. He's a lawyer. He signs it, and then he gives it back to his assistant. Now think about that flowchart for a second. He gives it back to his assistant, she scans it, and then she replies to my email, and attaches a PDF with a scanned in, typed out, signed, proofwritten, and then scanned back in again document. That's their workflow. Very effective. It's great. It's it's really uh, that's what they that's what they do. Um, that is just a, f a funny example. Another problem that we are obviously having. I mean, maybe you guys haven't that kind of stuff, but we have a lot of that stuff. Um, for example, Angus Angus uh, tax accountant. I provided them all the information, I sent them a lot of emails, I really made it clear to them, I said we need this and uh, that. They didn't reply, they replied to emails with a different subject line than the one I sent them to and so on and so forth. They were basically, they couldn't handle the information, they didn't have any processes. So that's my problem, I'm always like, I'm always running into business and I'm thinking like, guys, you have totally not figured out how that stuff needs to work. And I said, as I said, they don't make their processes explicit, so they can look at them and they can maybe improve them. So one of the results from, uh, from my work is that I have 
I was so frustrated with the teams I was working with. I'm not really frustrated. I'm not an angry guy. But I saw a need to clarify uh, where people, where things go, and how people should communicate. So I came up with this funny idea and I made a document. I, I called it. I told everybody we're not going to run tight operations. And here are the rules for tight operations. And I came up with what I call a framework or a communication protocol for teams, which basically means for people who collaboratively work, they build, create something together in a digital context. And I realized that we all have certain channels that we're using. There's got to be email, probably you guys have some kind of team chat. It may even be Skype, even though I don't like Skype. But uh, then you also, you know, if you work with people, you need some kind of screen sharing, you may do some video conferencing, you need to share files, and so on and so forth. And I realized there's a huge problem that uh, people have, and so I, uh, I'm currently writing what I call the Tide Operations Handbook, which is going to be just open source, and I hope just it's going to be like a bit of a manifesto that basically sorts out where things go. And it's my experience, especially around communication, like that kind of stuff that my lawyer did, that's basically the nemesis of titles. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm just working on that at the moment. And uh, these are my contact details. And I obviously would not take your questions if you have any. I mean, it's great. For, it's it's good for doing video calls and stuff. And everybody has it. You know, like everybody has it. One of the problems is everybody has a private Skype account. Once you go corporate or in, a kind, in some kind of team, even like on the I work with some agencies, in an agency or a project manager, for example, everybody was um, starting to use their private Skype account. So you get a lot of mingling between your private. It's really hard to separate between. Some people have a good idea. Um, Chris Patrick, for example, he labels all the people that he's professionally working with in Skype, and he puts, before you can name people like you want, he puts a little, um, in brackets, he puts like client or something, so that he knows that these are not private people. And then you always use Skype, so you are on it, and people contact you in, in your off hours and stuff. And I don't like the protocol, so sometimes you open up Skype and then you get messages from three days ago, and you're like, what? And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work well from, from you know, uh, mobile phones to... There's really better stuff that is more powerful, more reliable. We use HipChat. HipChat is great. Uh, it's also now free uh, for... Um, kind of like they really made it up, so it's... And it would only be two bucks a month if you use it in a team. And also another thing a lot of people have probably heard of Slack. That's a new team chat kind of app. You can do funny stuff if you if you're really into like I'm working with a developer, so um, if somebody says, for example, in our team chat something like Bravo, then uh, there's gonna come up something just clapping and, and stuff like that. So you can, you can make it a little funny and customize it and you know, searchable. What else? Sure. Your third website looks like a very intriguing job title. Um, can you come to the bill? Yeah, so uh, I met actually like uh, maybe I don't know how many years ago, but I met uh, Chris Kirkland, who's running a website called Artweb, which is a website builder for artists, um, painters, photographers, and so on. Um, and I met him here at the Four Hour Work Week meetup, and we um, started working together. I worked with him on Artwork for quite some time, did the marketing. And we also run this little podcast. And Chris basically came up with the idea of the Hobo CEO. And he had the domain already and he had written a couple of blog uh, posts. Um, the idea is, actually, is obviously how you would run a business from, as Chris always says, abroad. He's a uh, Brit. So, uh, 
he had been running his, his business for, with people in different time zones, like a really, a really remote team. That's why I also you know, came up with a lot of the ideas about how we should communicate, how we should do the meetings. Especially if you're moving from everybody has to be in the same place. Like when I said, uh, hell is other people and, and the lawyer and the accountant and stuff. When I'm in Thailand and I'm talking to the accountant on the phone, calling the accountant on the phone, people often say stuff to me like they think I'm on vacation and they also, um, they also say stuff like, let's meet when you're back. And I'm like, why? I mean, I'm really, I mean, I have, I have thought about it, I have really good, I'm not, no. I, and, and if we meet, what I do is I'm going to write it down everything we say and send you a kind of like a, you know, that's what we agreed upon, these are the action steps and so on. Because I realized, that's why I call it Thai, also very German, I realized that it's nice if you can meet people and then you sit there and talk about stuff, but not everything gets done. And, um, it's a lame excuse. The whole idea of it would be easier if I saw... I mean, I understand that I need to see people. I, that's why I'm here. That's why we meet. I, I may also, you know, uh, go out of my way to see clients I'm working with. Some, to build a, a trustful relationship. But the funny thing is, if you talk to, to those people and how they work with others, a lot of people don't realize how much they actually do outsource. Like, we think... In, we think high level automation, like doing it from everywhere, all over the world. A lot of people, they are there, um, as it's also, it's very good described in the book Remote by uh, Thurston Signals, Basecamp. They also say, like, look, most people's accountant is not in their office. Your graphic designer or the guy who's running your website, your webmaster, might not be in your office. So you're already working with those people on a kind of location-independent basis. And that's why, I, that's why I think if you aim at what if we would never have to meet, then if you do, it could be great, but you know, it's way more robust. That's the, that's the main idea. Yeah, sure. You're always in such a process uh, where it's like, you always have a process system, but there's a certain uh, certain point when you said now yeah, I mean, obviously, that's not everything I do is, uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, it's a bit reductionist to say, but it, I, um, one of my teachers said I'm good at abstraction, like, well, even when, when I was in school, and I think when he said it, I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, it's, I think it's also a, a, like a skill, something you, you can practice, and once you start applying it to some of your processes, you go some, somewhere and you see it, like, like I mentioned, like Taylor said in his making uh, in his uh, blog post about implicit and explicit, he said, he had the example, he said he, he went into a fitness studio and the onboarding process, like he was becoming a customer, customer of theirs, and he said like it was horrible, they had no idea, they didn't give him an introduction and so on and so forth, so he basically said that's because they never looked at the process and it's easier to, it's always easier to do this from the outside. So uh, that's why I did it on somebody else's business. It might be actually a, a bit harder if you are the center of your business and the bottleneck to really get out of it. As I said, my girlfriend didn't believe me and she was very um, suspicious whether that's really gonna happen. And then it happened, at, at, at least with a lot of the, some parts of the business. So now we're traveling and it works. We didn't totally automate it, but it's pretty good. Hey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.